The following is an Ice on Mars presentation. Hey everyone, let's talk today about a late 80s killer doll movie that spawned a franchise. Yes, that's right. We're going to be talking about Puppet Master. What the fuck? Um, This is Michael T. Bradley. And this is Audrey Ivancy. So let's start out with just a basic plot synopsis, okay? So we're we're looking at a, a movie about... <sighs> I don't know where to start with this movie. The movie itself starts in 1939 with a long, drawn-out uh, sequence in which William Hickey is killed. Which, by the way, I, I thought William Hickey must have been paid in pain pills for this film. What do you think? <laughs> Definitely. Because he, he gives the sleepiest performance of his career or anyone else's career on film, I think. So Andre Toulon, right, doll maker from the late 30s, is hunted down by Nazis. And anyway, that's not, I, I think they're Nazis, right? The yeah, Gestapo? that's yeah. exactly right. So he, he ends up lodging in at the Bodega Bay Inn. Right, which seems a horrible name for an inn. Like, it's like the supermarket inn, right? I mean, that's or a tiny supermarket inn, but that's, that's what it's called. And that's where he winds up. And he dies, and he's discovered the secret behind animating toy dolls using an Egyptian magical means. A and, ritual of some kind. Right. And so then, kind of unrelatedly, 50 or so years later, uh, there is a group, of, there are a group of psychics, and they get together and they're looking for just, I don't know, magical stuff, I guess. And they kind of fall apart because they don't really like each other. But, uh, and this is all kind of just inferred. This inferred. is all <laughs> inferred from what we see on screen. They kind of break up, and then and, and then one of them dies, and he makes it so that everyone has to come to the to see him before he gets buried. And, and you know, we eventually find out that he had uh, found Toulon's stuff. Oh yeah, so Neil Gallagher, in. Neil Gallagher is the, <laughs> the man who's now passed away. Isn't, wasn't he? Didn't he? Isn't he the, one of the brothers from Oasis? I yeah, I think that's right. Uh, Oasis fame. Okay, so he's left a widow who meets and greets these psychics that come in. She doesn't really realize what it is that's going on, only that her husband's left her, basically with this estate to take care of. Right, the Bodega Bay The Inn. Bodega Bay Inn. And there's all these people that seem to have had some history with her husband. She doesn't really understand. They had kind of had a flash romance of about, what, two years, I think? Yeah, two or three, somewhere in there, yeah. So they're all gathered together because he's dead. So then uh, the puppets kill them because the, puppet is, the puppets are now controlled by uh, Neil Gallagher, who actually was able to reanimate himself after killing himself, which I was like, man, that is a hell of a test to make sure that your powers are working. Like, oh, I figured out this, this, this way to uh, bring, uh, bring things back to life, and I'm going to test it out by killing myself. Though, though possibly he tested it out by killing his... His wife's parents? Is yeah, that I think he just didn't like his wife or her parents and right. just wanted to be alone. But in the I, off chance, this stuff works. Yeah, there, his his reasonings were kind of uh, uh, kind of vague, I guess would be the best way to put them. So, yeah, and then Alex is our protagonist, our Leonine protagonist, I guess. And he kind of meanders through the climax and survives along with the widow. There's really no... I mean, it's really just kind of... There's not, like, a big purpose. Neil Neil seemed to be wanting to bring everyone back to life, to live on forever with him. So, I, I mean, I guess his motives were kind of decent in a way. Well, but didn't he refer to the puppets as some sort of waste of something? What did he say? Like, you, you, well, he calls one, like, a useless Cretan pinhead. And he, That's right. He obviously doesn't give a shit about the puppets, which... I'm like, you know, I, I get that this is Puppet Master, though really this movie should have been called Puppet Hunt. But but still, I mean, I, I to me that made sense. I was like, well, I don't really... If, if I were looking for immortality, I wouldn't give much of a shit about puppets either. But the puppets were pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as, as a movie, the puppets are the draw yeah. for this film, because there's, there's really not much else. So there's the basic idea, I guess, though... A lot of things are just kind of left up to the imagination, especially the end. We don't know what's going on with the puppets. It's just like, well, I'll see you later. I'm going to go back to Yale where I work. Have fun with your murderous puppet hotel. A question that I, I wanted to ask, Audrey, I want to see your thought on this. Do you feel that this was a movie 
that did well enough that they thought they could spawn a franchise, or do you think this was intended to launch a franchise? You see, I'm a little confused about where we could go either which way. It's that, um, you know, the movie could have just ended. We never really found out what happened to the puppets. Do they go on? Does this hotel continue to be overrun by these, these little puppets with the widow? Just Diana be their caretaker. No, nothing was ever really said about that, so leaves me to believe that maybe we would see them later in the future. But then I think about also at the same time in 1989 when this movie came out, there weren't a whole bunch of franchises out there. There wasn't a number two, number three, number four, number five, number six, number seven of anything. Right. Though I, I was actually, so one of the reasons that I got this, and, and, and if you guys, you know, I, we're, we're going to try to keep tackling Puppet Master movies. One of the reasons that I wanted to use this here at the beginning is because the first nine Puppet Masters, along with the first three Killjoys, are available in this amazing box set for under five dollars. <laughs> uh, so, please grab a copy, read along, let us know your feedback and your comments and thoughts on this series as we go through it as well. But I also got the Trancers box set from Full Moon because I I used to back in college. I loved watching Full Moon stuff, and I'm uh, enjoying reliving it now. But I, so Trancers was made in 1985 by basically all the Full Moon people. And then when Charlie Band started Full Moon itself in either 89 or 90, one of the first things he did that he did was get the band back together, uh, no pun intended, and, and start working on making that a series. And so I believe in 89 when this was made, Full Moon was already becoming a thing. And the idea was to kind of launch franchises. It definitely does feel... You know, there are there are certain horror movies where you feel like this is supposed to be self-contained. And then a franchise is launched off of a stray comment that someone made or a hole in the logic that people were able to pull the story out of, etc., etc., etc. This one, though, ends so wide open that I, 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 I think they were trying to start a franchise. But I do think that, you know, continuing on in the series, you get way more puppets later on. Do you? Puppets weren't, weren't the big highlight of the plot in this movie. Right. I mean, you could draw a comparison about these psychics that come in, the five psychics. They all kind of have a different characteristic that makes themselves unique, kind of like the puppets have different characteristics mm -hmm. that make them unique. But I think that there's more concentration on the actual actors as characters than there are <laughs> as the really puppets. So? Yeah, I, I, maybe. But I, I, I don't necessarily think that the actors have anything more than the basic stereotypes that, you know, like Cabin in the Woods uh, likes to poke fun at. I mean, we have, like, the girl who's obsessed with sex, the... Uh, white witch. Yeah, the white witch who, I don't know, I the kind of alcoholic bitchy one, Yeah, I guess, hickory would be her. fanning, dragon blood sniffing, <laughs> elevator rape. Uh, what else did she do? No, yeah, that the wasn't the white witch. Foot, wasn't it? No, no, no. That was the sexy girl, oh. right? Oh, she, yes, yeah, of course it was. <laughs> that was her psychometry. Which, I, yeah, we'll get to, I, so, I, yeah, we'll get to there. Because I have, I have so much to talk about that scene. I, but this definitely was, you know, uh, uh, kind of a by-the-numbers uh, slasher movie. Just with a unique murderer in the form of Egyptian... <laughs> Egyptian life after death infused puppets, which you know, my thought was, if the Egyptians had this method for life after death, why aren't there more Egyptians or Egyptian puppets or cat cats running around that are you know undead? I mean, it brings up a whole lot of questions about why didn't the Egyptians use this more if they had if they had created it? But I, they did have the stuffed dog. Right. Right. That's that's definitely implied at the end that that she that the widow now has control over this because she reanimates a stuffed dog. Yeah, exactly. I, th I think overall the the biggest issue that I have with this film because I I actually decently enjoyed watching it. My biggest issue is that every scene is way too damn long. Every every like I I, I wrote down during the prologue prolong because the 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 which really isn't a pun because prolong is a word but the. Um, the, uh, uh, the prologue just goes on so long. Like, I thought, I made fun of the fact that William Hickey is just like, oh, don't worry, they won't catch us. And then he finally gets around to, like, putting the puppets in their case and hiding them away. He sees two guys in black out of the window going to come to his hotel to kill him. And I'm like, come on, William Hickey, move it. But no, he has plenty of time. 
Because these guys getting to the top floor takes like 35 minutes, I swear. Almost as much time as it took a blade running around looking at everyone's feet. Yeah, that the puppet cam in this movie is incredible. <laughs> puppet POV all over the place and a lot of grunting. A lot of uh, heavy breathing and grunting. Hissing. Yeah, hissing and... and uh, even Neil, who's a reanimated corpse, uh, he has a lot of breathing. And mm -hmm. being an animated puppet or a reanimated corpse doesn't seem to stop your need to breathe a lot. Which, again, raises more questions yeah, than answers. Yeah, more um, ears, nose, and throat questions. <laughs> right. So let me tell you my biggest problem with killer doll movies, which was somewhat addressed in here. My biggest issue is, if I see a little killer doll... Like, if I see some sort of doll come to life, it's like, okay, there's probably going to be that immediate moment of uh, the original Freudian interpretation of surrealism, like that shock, like that super real, like two things that are real but shouldn't exist together, you know, puppets and living. Okay, yeah, there'd be that moment of shock, but then after that it would be like, it's a goddamn puppet, let me just kick it into the wall. Uh, and that does happen a few times in here, but they really have to create these uh, uh, almost, uh, I, I wouldn't say as complex as Rube Goldberg, but, you know, these very, like, intense setups where it's like, okay, you can almost kind of sort of believe that this could happen because this very particular thing, they don't do a great job of it. What did you think about that sex ritual with the lady and, and the guy? What was it? Um, what's his name? I, I, From I the know. the Pinsa medical research, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I know you're talking about. They were having some that, sort of sex, that, sex thing. That's the scene that I have like so much to say on. I want to I want to save most of that for our WTF moment section when we get to it. But 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 uh, yeah, I mean that that scene especially was you know it was like we are cleverly laying down all of these things so that when it happens you will believe because oh, this was set up, and oh, that was set up, but it, it just, it wasn't set up very well. I mean, it was it was set up, but then they didn't execute it very well. No no pun intended again. <laughs> but, but like, for instance, there's a, there's a maid, and that whole scene, which again, I think that scene was about a third of the movie. She hears something, goes and looks, nothing's there. She goes back to the fireplace, goes and looks again when she hears the second thing. Nobody's there. Goes back, and somebody has stolen her poker, and... The pinhead doll smacks her in the head with a poker, and an alarming amount of blood flies onto the woods in the fireplace, but she doesn't. <laughs> Which, that's like some sort of uh, a Warren Commission report waiting to happen right there. I really wonder at what point in this movie did they realize the puppets were more interesting than the characters? What do you think? I don't know. Because <laughs> that's I mean, it lends itself to dolls, and of course I like dolls. Right. Well, I, you know, what, what, what little girl doesn't like playing with dolls, right? Truth. Right. Which, because Audrey is seven years old, so. <laughs> but, but the, I, I, I think especially, I don't know if the screenwriter did or if it was just badly written. I mean, because what the hell was up with that climax? So in, 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 in the Are climax. Are we still talking about that bedroom scene? No, oh, no. Okay. <laughs> in the climax of the movie. Literally, our so our our protagonist Alex, who has the most amazing feathered hair. Like I wish I had that hair and could pull it off. Really, he says at one point specifically, "I've come here to try to prevent a vision that I had from happening." Then the vision happens, and he just stands mutely by, vaguely uninterested the entire time. And he's like, "Well, my I guess my premonition did come true." Guess I'll just. I, I mean, I, it, it I guess seemed. I'm okay with that. It was like, <laughs> yeah, it seemed oddly Here okay. Like, well, this really isn't as bad as I thought it was. What did you think of Alex? Did you think he worked as a protagonist? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I. Did you like the hair? Um, yeah, the Lionel hair. It was, <laughs> yeah. yeah, very time time suited. You know, I like that he was he was supposed to be the smartest one. He was very down to earth, and the lady he liked lived. So I thought that was kind of neat that they had had some sort of connection. I, I will admit, I did like the fact that it really felt as if that was going to be a romantic subplot that wouldn't fit, but then at the end they give each other a hug and they leave, and that's it. That's the uh, that's mm -hmm. the extent of it. But to hear that, you know, the widow, I, he probably never was with her 
with Mary, the um, Mr. Gallagher, Neil, right. was never really interested in her romantically anyways. And I don't, I really wonder if Alex was either. I think Alex was, I, I think Alex was homosexual. Oh, well, it's quite possible. Because the because basically he's come on to by two women in the film and both times he's just like whoa, whoa, whoa hey lady no thanks maybe it's because he was working right <laughs> he was he was on the case but I really got I got a feeling there was more going on there I mean I he was trying to sleep through the walls when they could hear the other yeah thing going on. yeah he's pretty he, upset about that right and he uh, he obviously spent a lot of time on his hair. Really impressive hair. Lots of depth gel. Yeah. Which, speaking of hair, that, that was another thing yeah. that I noted uh, that I really liked. During during that scene, they actually gave the actor sex hair, which mm -hmm. I thought was a nice little touch. Though they did not give Alex bedhead during the climax, because the climax, he's woken up in the middle of the night, and he just has still perfectly feathered, quaffed hair. Yes. The movie didn't know where to start. It had, like, five different beginnings. We, we start in 1939 in the hotel with Toulon's suicide, and uh, then we go to Yale, then we go to a carnival, then we go, or possibly before the carnival, we go to a, a research institute, and then it finally starts to congeal. That, that was a thing that I felt this movie, this movie would have worked better as a novel, I think. Would you have read the whole book? I guess it depends on how well it was written. I, I can't really get into horror anymore, mm -hmm. but when I was a kid, I definitely would have read this book. Because it, it, it has this feeling of all these different little vignettes, and then finally they're pulled together. But when you're watching the movie, it just feels like, should I care about this part, or what's going on? And where are the goddamn puppets? That's, <laughs> that's, that's a question that you ask a lot in this film. I'm assuming the puppets play a, a bigger role later. But yeah, in this, they, they not so much. Very quickly, I want to point out a, a possibly scarier movie would be Sock Puppet Master. Yeah. Definitely smell it. Right <laughs> <laughs> so they they um we're, we're gonna get to the, we're gonna get to the what the fuck moments uh, in just a second. And start on that, but one thing that I did want to point out, everybody's we mentioned a, a little bit about this already, but just to go into a bit more detail about it, everybody's motive in this film seems very murky. At one point, uh, the sexy lady asks her boyfriend, husband, whatever the hell he is. You know, what, what are you going to do with this power when you find it? And he says, rule the world. Well, the power is supposedly immortality. If I were given immortality, what's step two? Like, step one, immortality. Step three, rule the world. Where's step two? How, how would you use immortality to rule the world? Because I don't have a game plan. How about you? Well, I would assume I would probably pickpocket all my friends on their way out and <laughs> afford a nice home. And, uh, yeah, I'd... Yeah, that's about it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't, I don't, I, I think that was a shaky plan at best. Oh, I, one other thing I wanted to point out real fast. I love exposition diaries in horror movies. I love whenever somebody leaves behind a diary that's like, tonight I summon the foulest of all demons. I will write about it now in a way that would only be helpful for someone reading this years in the future. Yeah. That, that was one of the most brilliant things about Evil Dead. Evil Dead, yeah. Yeah, where they, they, they just parodied that to the extreme. All right, so let's talk about what the fuck moments. Okay. Definitely for me, and I think for you... <laughs> Clearly. Was the, ...was the sex scene. So, Audrey, I want to perform a little thought experiment with yeah, you, okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is much in the vein of... This is Thought Experiment 517A, all right? <laughs> okay. So, and, and listeners, you can play along at home. So close your eyes. You're in bed. You're nude, or at least close to nude, and you're with your lover, right? Now, your lover ties your hands to the, to, the, uh, to the bed, and you're into this, so this isn't like some sort of scary, like, rape fantasy that's going on. Or maybe it is, but it's a sexy, Hi, scary rape fantasy. <laughs> right. You get to the point where you're going at it, and you're going at it for a while, and then your lover is like, oh, hey, uh, hold on a minute, I heard a noise. <laughs> oh, and you're blindfolded, too. Uh, blindfolded as well. So you are completely powerless. Your pi your partner goes away, and you kind of freaking out. And you say a few things, and then you feel tiny, tiny hands on you, tiny, tiny hands, and possibly a tiny <laughs> mouth, and all is quiet, even though you're asking what's going on. And this is what you hear. <clears throat> What is your reaction? 
um, did the noise or to the <laughs> tiny hands or was it the mouth that I felt on cupping my all, chest? All this, this, this whole scenario, I'm, what is your reaction I'm at this like, point? Yeah, I mean, you went away and came back with what, one hand? And, possibly um, two tiny possibly hands. Possibly two. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm cold, right? Because um, I'm not wearing a blanket. Let's, for the sake of... I no longer have a warm body on top of me, right? <laughs> right, but let's, you know, it's it's the, the friction and the heat, and let's say that you've turned the, uh, the heaters up so the cold is not an issue here. And we have already turned. There's no cats running around, and there may right. You don't. You don't dog. own a cat. There are no. There are no animals that you've seen. But I, I don't know. I mean, I don't really have much of a choice but to lay there, right? Right. But what's what? What's your mental reaction? Um. Well, curious, and I guess is it right to be turned on by something that can't really turn you on? There's no wrong oh, answers okay. here, Audrey. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't. This isn't a, a scientific thought test that you can fail. Well, at some point, I might have to try to get the answer, and if I don't, I guess I'll just stand there, or lay there, struggling. <laughs> the reaction for the character in the movie that this happens to is, ooh, that's hot. <laughs> that noise, if I were in that situation, you can open your eyes okay, now. That, that, was, that was real uh, commitment there. But no, my reaction in that situation would be abject horror. <laughs> Feeling tiny hands and that noise. That noise to me does not say, I mean, unless it's like connected with feeling a blowjob at the same time, maybe that's what we were missing. Like maybe Blade is filleting the dude and we just don't see it. Oh, we never knew what happened to her little feet. <laughs> <laughs> but, but he feels like contact. And I'm going to give the movie the benefit of the doubt and say maybe the puppets are warm to the touch because oh, they have is. life in them. Mm -hmm. Yet still, tiny, tiny hands. I mean, now that I've seen Haunted House 1 and Haunted House 2 with the, that Wayne's brother, Annabelle is the character. It's another one of those sexual doll characters. But he does, I think, a five-minute sex sequence with the doll intentionally. Mm. Now that I know that that exists, and I've seen it executed very well, I wouldn't mind actually being blindfolded and laying on that bed with Leech Woman. But you would know it was Leech Woman going in, right? Yes, I would prefer that. Right. I mean, let's... Okay, so let's say that you're even, you know, you're open to the idea of doll sexuality. <laughs> Still, in that situation, if you felt hands that obviously weren't your lovers that you were expecting, and nobody was talking, and you heard choking noise... But we realize <laughs> this is kind of like a haunted place where my lover at the time has that ability to touch things and then remember what was there, what was on the bed, what was on the toilet, who was there last. Right, right. I, I mean, I guess that's true. Yeah, going to the bathroom just must be hell for her. <laughs> she has a psychometry, so she, she touches things and sees what was there before. But yeah, it's... Uh... Okay, so that, that, that thought experiment did not go the way that I thought it would. <laughs> but that's okay. And what was coming out of that doll's mouth again? Leeches. Leeches. And we ever find out why? That was that's her method of killing. Yeah, yeah. And she's named Leech Woman. I, I love that Toulon has these dolls and in his diary he says, In my hands they're peaceful loving creatures because, you know, Toulon seemed a sweet guy, right? Mm -hmm. And so some of his sweet loving creature dolls includes a female doll who coughs up leeches. And a uh, guy with a drill bit for a head. A gesture with the spinning head. <laughs> right. Well, no, th to be fair, that's not very offensive, you know? And offensive in the way of, like, offense versus defense. Oh, fair enough. I, it, but definitely creepy. That was my what-the-fuck moment. Do you, do you have anything else that, that you saw as a what-the-fuck moment? I, I, mean, I think I was just surprised to see the taxidermy dog in the White Witch's box of magic. Yeah, yeah. Taxidermy to me is especially It weird. takes a certain kind of person to stuff their, their favorite animal and carry it around everywhere. Right. Well, so do you think she just did that because that was a character trait, or do you think that she did that because they she was part of a group that was seeking out immortality? I think that, that, that the dog was used so that we could have that revelation at the end yeah. where the widow was able to reanimate the dog. Yeah. And show that she was now, had assumed control. Of course, if that were the case, you would think maybe there just would have been a stuffed dog at the hotel. And, like, you could have used that as kind of like, oh, this place is creepy or whatever. Yeah, like some stuffed deer heads on the wall. You could reanimate those later and carry them around. 
<laughs> you can't put that down on the <laughs> on the stairwell and the, the deer head just runs out. I would have been a lot more interesting having a deer head follow her up the stairs. Right, right. Frolic around behind her. Yeah. And that's a deer, yeah. Why, why all the white witch magic? If she didn't really end up helping very much at the end, what were all those things that she was trying to do? Yeah, that, I... Was that just to kind of authenticate their mission, that they have somebody like that in the other realm, since they were going so metaphysical with this ritual? Well, I, I, to me, it seemed like she was kind of the, the priest in a Lovecraftian horror tale, in the sense that she had all these things that were supposed to work, but they really worked on a way more, like, low-level mental level rather than a actually stave off evil in a, in a true sense level, you know? That's that's what I got out of it. Just like so, like her stuff, I think worked, but not enough to stop this Egyptian. I, I keep wanting to say curse because that's what comes to mind, but really this Egyptian power. Power. Yeah. So I, I guess that's what they were because you know, like with the psychometrist. I mean, she had real powers, and they obviously were doing things. They 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 had a lot of uh, uh, stuff going. Oh on. yeah. Well, now you did remind me. Her boyfriend. What yeah. a weirdo. Yeah, he was creepy. And it's weird we know his turn-ons and his turn-offs. Right, right. Like, she's like, oh, people had sex on this bed. It's so hot. And they were movie stars. And he's like, whatever, bitch, we're working. But then later in the hot in the bathtub, she's like, two women were making out here. And he's like, oh, yeah? Give me the details. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then he also gets turned on by hearing about the guy he doesn't like who's recently dead. He's like, let me know if you get any details on him and his wife. <laughs> Definitely very 80s in that sense, in having weird sexuality kind of shoved into your face. Yeah, I think this is totally 80s, from the hair to the shoulder pads to the dusty rose vintage dresses. <laughs> of the shoulder pads. <laughs> Jesus, you can take out an eye with that shit. Also the fact that the I think the only breast we see in the film is during the rape scene. Mm -hmm. The elevator, and, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's very, like, 80s. Just, like, just shove a breast in there anywhere. It and doesn't matter the context, things. you know. Uh, uh, it's got a tit that's going to sell, you know. That was, that was very, that felt very 80s to me. So uh, something that I, I think is good for a closing thought here is let's examine this film and say, what can make it better? Even if we liked the film in question, what can make it better? Sometimes you look at a movie and you think, oh, this would be so much better if only the lead actor were different, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what? I think I would need more Blade. Yeah. He's my favorite puppet. I like his uh, Guy Fox look. Kind of like mysterious. And, mm -hmm. and I like he has a blade and a hook. Apparently he can use his hook to move chairs. Yeah, yeah. He... And he can climb with it, get up in the peepholes and look through doors at people doing whatever on the other side. What was with his eyes, though? So it looked like when he would get angry or when he would become more alert and concerned, his eyes would kind of flip open and look a little more metallic. Yeah, it was weird because it it, it really made it look like at that point he had eyes, but obviously... Like a dilation he, of some kind. Yeah, but obviously he could see before that. So it seemed a strange... I, I was almost wondering if they were like little guns in there. I think I hear later that um, they'll eventually grow red mm. in one of these upcoming um, sequels. May and maybe that was the intention at the time, and it just didn't work out. And mm -hmm. They were like, fuck it, let's just go with them flipping open. Okay, so more Blade. That's what would have fixed more it More Blade, yep, definitely. I think for me it's two things, because I... I I wasn't wowed by any of the actors here, but I didn't think... I, I didn't think the acting was terrible. I think for me, what I needed is tightening of every scene. Every scene just goes on Too forever. Long, yeah. Especially there's this one scene where the, the white witch's death scene. She is scrambling down this hallway for like 20 minutes with, a, with like a puppet slowly ambling along. And she just keeps flinging him away, which is funny as hell. But it's like, it, what the hell is going on here? He like calf massages her to death. It's very confusing. The, uh, so I, I think it could have used tightening. It's an 88-minute film. I think if it were about 75 minutes... Maybe about 45, even, <laughs> that would have helped it out a lot. And the other thing, too, is the climax. I just, I that frustrated me to no end, the fact that our our protagonist, who's supposed to be the one, if not propelling the action of the movie, at least our cipher to be viewing everything, just stands slack-jawed once the climax starts and never does anything until the end credits where he hugs and goes away. Yeah. Yeah. So. Back to work. Back to work. Yeah. All right. So... 
I think we have uh, covered everything to a decent extent. So for now, this is Michael T. Bradley. And Audrey Ivancy. We'll see you uh, uh, next time on... What the fuck? Um, that's Angie Hardison, by the way. If you have any sort of comments or feedback, please write to info at iceonmars.net and tell us what you think. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You have been listening to Ice on Mars.